Welcome to Circular Plastic Summit 2023. Uh, this year will be about PT packaging. And for you who were at our last event uh, about a year ago uh, on PP packaging, uh, uh, remember how this looks like. Uh, it is a live event that we are, uh, we have an audience in our uh, room here and we also have participants online. It is being live recorded and um, uh, The PP film for you who didn't see that event is still available to see online So if you are interested in PP film as well, not only P PT packaging uh, You can uh, see it afterwards uh, This event is organized by Swedish plastic recycling together with Förpackningsinsamlingen, and FTI. And as I said, it is being live recorded and will also be available afterwards. Um, my name is Rickard Jansson and I uh, will to be today's host of this event. And uh, I work normally at Swedish Plastic Recycling as uh, a development engineer and material expert. In the studio, we have about 40 people and online uh, we expect about 500 people to listen to this event uh, during these uh, three hours. It is an honor to be here uh, for you all this afternoon. And as many probably already know, we face major challenges when it comes to uh, uh, pa plastic packaging uh, and making it a part of the circular economy uh, and sustainable. We often hear about the negative uh, sides of plastics, uh, such as uh, littering, uh, plastics in the oceans, uh, hazardous substances in, in plastic, as well as the climate impact as a result of its fossil origin. Plastics packaging is really on the political agenda today, uh, which we notice through major changes in uh, both na national and international legislation. The proposal for a new packaging and packaging waste regulation prescribes that only recyclable plastic packaging with minimum content of recycled materials shall be applied within the European Union by 2030. In today's pr presentations, <coughs> we uh, will focus on some of these aspects, but we will mainly focus on the solutions to the problems that we have. Uh, in today's first ses session, we have uh, speakers representing the recycling industry. And after a coffee break between quarter past two and a quarter to three, we will have presenters uh, talking about the design of PT packaging. Each session will end with a, a panel discussion where we start from questions that you partic participants have. Uh, either send it in before or that we have from the audience. And we will, uh, after the, these uh, two sessions, um, uh, if we haven't been able to answer all the questions, we will try to summarize them afterwards and send to you who have been to this event. We will now jump to the first presenter, uh, which is a part of the state-of-the-art recycling of PT. So Matthias Philipsson is uh, the CEO of Swedish Plastic Recycling. And Swedish Plastic Recycling is currently uh, taking the world's largest and most modern facility uh, for recycling into operation, called Site Zero. 
With Site Zero, uh, Swedish plastic recycling will sort out transparent PET bottles, PET trays, as well as colored PET bottles for material re recycling. And the floor is yours, Matthias. Thank you, Richard. Hi, everybody. This is a, a day of great enjoyment for me. Uh, we try to do this every year. Uh, hopefully, in the future, we will make it uh, maybe twice a year. And the purpose of this uh, day today and the, the other events that we will uh, keep on holding uh, in the future is basically to provide our customers with first-hand knowledge on what is going on in Europe regarding innovation, uh, recycling cap capabilities, etc. And this is a way for us also to provide you with direct information instead of hearing it second-hand from us. So I would like to thank very much our expert, uh, experts that are present here today. Like Richard said, I'm CEO of Swedish Plastic Recycling. What we do is actually we help our customers uh, fulfill the extended producer responsibility. But more importantly, we help our customers achieve their climate goals because there is a very, very strong connection between plastics and climate impact. We are actually owned by our customers and we have 8,500 Swedish customers uh, that we are helping fulfill this responsibility. We are a non-profit uh, company. That basically means if we make some profits, we invest it in the future technology in order to help our customers uh, increase recycling rates and lower the climate impact. Otherwise, we uh, lower the gate fees or the packaging fees that our customers are uh, paying to us. So, uh, but we are still uh, active on a competitive market. That basically means that there are other actors as well. Uh, like Richard mentioned to you earlier, uh, I think everybody or most of people here today knows the benefits of plastics, but we have a few challenges. One is, of course, littering, uh, oceans, etc. Luckily, this is very, very little problem in Sweden. Uh, it's almost non-measurable uh, how many packaging that actually ends up in the environment. But we have another huge challenge. And that is that we keep incinerating too much of the plastics that are being placed on the market. And why is that? Well, first, people tend to not sort at home sometimes. So about 50% is being sorted and ends up in our system. The other 50% goes directly to incineration. The other thing is that about half of the packaging that's been put on the market is actually designed for recycling. That gives us 25%. And then we have some uh, technological uh, losses during the way sorting and recycling. So that ends up in 20%. So currently we are uh, recycling 20% of what our customers are putting on the market. We are not satisfied with that figure, but from an interna international perspective, that figure is quite high. Uh, we are aiming to reach 55% by 2027, uh, 25, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we basically have two years in order to achieve that. And that will be a huge challenge, of course, but there's a possibility. Uh, with that being said, we are incinerating too much. There's another thing I also want to address, and that's the fact that what is actually being recycled is not always 
being recycled in the smartest, best way. And this is a huge difference between different recycling methods. So what is the purpose, what is our mission in Swedish plastic recycling? Well, it's to make plastic packaging part of the circular economy. And how do we do that? Well, we think our philosophy perfectly reflects how we are going to achieve that. By building Site Zero, we will sort out 12 different fractions. So we will sort out every type of plastic that is basically available on the packaging market. Then we will separately recycle each of them. This way, a packaging can become a new packaging and we don't have any losses of the material quality during the cycle. So we can keep on recycle and recycle. And what are we achieving by doing this? Well, we decrease the need for incineration because the packaging will stay in the circular loop. Secondly, we don't need that much fossil uh, raw material because since we are recycling the packaging again and again, we don't need that. So that's two purposes of circular recycling. Before I finish, I want to mention two things. Uh, there's a new regulation coming that will become law in every EU country. By 2030, every packaging that's being placed on the market has to have some content of recycled material. This is extremely important and probably some kind of a game changer. And the producers cannot wait until 2029 in order to secure those volumes. We have to start now, because this leg legislation will be in place in 2030, in seven years. What is good about us and the current situation in Sweden is that Swedish plastic recycling, we are sorting out five fractions today, and all of those five fractions can be used to become new packaging. And with Site Zero, with 12 fractions, at least 10 of them will be able, we, will we be able to use for new packaging again. And this is probably something that uh, will be of great importance for our customers because this will give you a good chance of securing some of those volumes already. The second thing I want to mention to you is a, a scientific report that will be presented in maybe a month or so, hopefully. Uh, we will have done that together with EV, IVL and Chalmers, a university in Sweden, where we have studied different uh, recycling philosophies. Uh, and this report will basically show that if you mix different types of packaging, the environmental benefits or the, the CO2 emissions will basically be, be the same as for direct incineration. On the other hand, if we sort each plastic and recycle them separately, this will have a dramatic decrease of CO2 emissions actually more than aviation in Sweden, we are talking about two to three percent of the total emissions in Sweden. So this is something that we will present and I'm sure it will be, become a big debate how to in best way recycle plastic packaging. So uh, today we're going to focus on PET and that's very good because PET can actually sometimes be used in food contact packaging. So there are huge benefits with PET. And now I will 
give the scene to the experts. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, please give uh, Matthias an uh, applause. Thank you. And we uh, will have Matthias back on stage in the end of this session uh, so that he can uh, answer your questions uh, together with the under, other presenters. We will now uh, continue with the next presenter, uh, who is uh, Willem uh, Christians. Please, Willem, come up on the stage. Willem uh, is a raw material proc procurement and business development manager uh, in Europe uh, at the Indorama Ventures Recycling Group and Velman Recycling. Please, Willem, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. So thank you all for, uh, for attending. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I would like to start off with a brief introduction of our company for the people that don't know us. Um, so I work for Indorama Ventures. Indorama Ventures is a global sustainable PT company. So we are in the PT resin business, but uh, we are also in recycling. And actually we have around 147 sites worldwide uh, in uh, 35 countries. And of that, we have a, a, a significant amount of recycling sites. Um, we have actually in 2011 already made our first steps into recycling when we acquired Wellman Recycling, a location in the Netherlands, which actually is one of the very first PT recycling facilities ever established in Europe. And Indorama did that because they saw the importance of developing circularity and sustainability. And with the knowledge we had since 2011, uh, is, uh, yeah, we have expanded our global footprint of recycling and by now we have 20 sites worldwide. Um, having said so, we are continuously expanding and actually have a commitment to upgrade our uh, capacity worldwide to 750 kilotons per annum in 2025. So, to give you some numbers, because it's, it's actually quite a lot. So, we have been recycling 85 billion PT bottles so far. In 2025, our commitment is to do that 50 million bottles per year. That's a lot. So, I have, I think, one second, that's 150,000 bottles. In 2030, we're going to double that to 100, 000, uh, 100 billion bottles a year. And for that, we're going to invest 3 billion. So, ju just some high-level numbers. Um, even in the last years in the pandemic, which has been difficult for many businesses, of course, we were still on track on the targets. And just to show you some numbers here, uh, 750 kilotons will be uh, 25, 1500 kilotons we are going to recycle worldwide, not only in Europe, in 2030. And we're going to do that by mechanical recycling, but also by chemical, or what we like to call advanced recycling. So what would that mean for you all here in the audience, because you're mostly from, from, from Sweden and let's say uh, Europe, uh, what would that mean? So our footprint in Europe uh, is as follows. We have seven facilities, seven mechanical recycling facilities in Europe. They're based in the Netherlands, in France, in Poland, and the Czech Republic at the moment. And there we recycle via mechanical process, uh, historically PET bottles, but I will tell you a bit later, since 2021, also clear mono material PET trays, which we get from, for example, uh, Svensk Plast Data Winning. So that's our current footprint. 2023 onwards. Well, from now on, we will be looking into chemical recycling. So material that we cannot recycle back into a clear PET packaging in a mechanical process, we will be, with partners, transforming via an advanced chemical process back into, uh, let's say, a new, clear, recycled virgin PET. So we will be ab able to create a much broader solution for the packaging industry. Besides that, we will also be introducing a new product in our portfolio by 2025 at various of our resin facilities, which is called an SPS. It's basically a resin which includes an amount of recycled content which uh, allows the brand owner to have the PT that has the amount of recycled content you need by legislation. So what does a mechanical process look like? I can imagine you're not all familiar with a recycling process, so uh, I will try to summarize it briefly. I only have 50 minutes from Wickard, so I have to speed it up. Otherwise, I'm talking till uh, 3 o'clock this afternoon. So basically, you have three, proce three process steps in mechanical recycling. It's sorting stage, it's grinding and washing, 
it's flake sorting. And optional, you have palletizing. So sorting is basically when we get the bales from a big sorting center, we break it up, it enters through conveyor belts, and you pass by various high-end sorting equipment to take out metals, colors, other plastics, etc. What's left is clear and light blue predominantly. That is then grinded into cornflake-sized pieces, which are undergoing a hot wash process to clean up. After that is dried, and then it enters again a sorting stage, where we no longer sort into percentage of purity, but PPM level. Flakes are sold to converters for producing new thermoform, uh, for example. But we can also add another step at some sites, which is extrusion, which we combine with a super cleaning process. And that's why you make it a food contact approved pallet. So our current portfolio consists of these products. So we have Arpet Flakes, Arpet Pallets, which we sell to the bottle industry, to the thermoform industry. We also have performance fibers. You see that in automotive industry, for example, before we get into a discussion. Upcycling, downcycling, those are long lifetime, high quality uh, products. So uh, we definitely see that also as a very good recycling application. Um, <coughs> but for the clear and the light blue packaging, uh, we prefer to have, let's say, a product A to a product A. So a bottle to a bottle, a tray to a tray. And uh, this is uh, why we developed the tray recycling over the last years. So what's our path forward as a whole value chain, as an industry? And what are the challenges we will be facing? Well, as a start, we as consumer, so that includes us not professionally, but us as people at home, we have just a history of being part of a very linear economy. We create the product, we consume the product, and we dispose of the product. Historically, since the 1960s, that has been the case. Of course, we are now very much aware, and I know Sweden is actually quite the front runner when it comes to sustainability. We are very much aware that we need to change and we need to move towards a more circular model. So let me explain a little bit how I, how we see that model, and what are the aspects that play a role here, and how we can move forward on our path to this increased sustainability. So just putting it into a graphic model, we see four stages in the whole value circle. It's the front end, it's a pack, use empty, collect and control, a back end, and we have some external factors that also play a role. So at the front end, it's the manufacturing and the, des uh, the ma design and manufacturing of the packagings. Then, of course, it's filled with food, with beverage, it's consumed by us, the consumer, it's empty then, and we discard it. Collect and control is all about waste sorting. Collecting and waste sorting. And back end is where we, we as recyclers come into play. Because here is where we turn that waste into a valuable material and you feed it back into the front end again. So, as you see, it's a circle, it's all connected. So what's important for us all is that we need to collaborate and communicate. Because it's all not that black and white. There are a lot of nuances, a lot of aspects, and not every time there's one civil, silver bullet answer to a solution, or to a problem. So we need to do that, and we need to also include and look at some external factors. And I think this is probably a thing that uh, Jean de Mille is going to talk about, like legislation, for example, that plays a role, which can help us, can also create some barriers. So we need to, be, we need to find a way together how to move forward in the best way. So let me address some themes. And I'm aware I have only seven minutes left, so I need to move ahead. A path forward, well, we need to look at, for example, design for recycling. Because mechanical recycling, when you look at the, at the recycling processes, is often the one that has the lowest environmental footprint. So the design of a packaging, if you want to have it back as new raw material, needs to be focused on enabling mechanical recycling. And chemical recycling will be complementary to that. Then, consumer awareness, consumer education certainly will play a role. Because the consumer needs to know what to do with the packaging and what not. Then, increasing of collection and increasing of sorting. I don't have to elaborate on that a lot, because Matthias already told it very well. Then, for us as recyclers, we need to continue to put an effort to grow capacity with technology, uh, on sorting and new recycling uh, activities like advanced recycling. 
And of course, talking about legislation, uh, a bit boring, but uh, Jean-Emile, uh, I think you will dive into this probably. Legislation, we need to make sure that we can comply with that and uh, make sure it works for us as the whole value chain. A little bit of a deep dive, design for recycling. Uh, yeah, how can we together do something with that? Uh, for example, we as recyclers, we are always open to exchange thoughts with the value chain uh, based on our recycling experience. We are not experts in marketing, etc., but we are experts in recycling. There is also, for example, the design manual from, uh, from FDI, for example. And that you also have other design tools like from Petcore or uh, Plastic Recyclers Europe Reciclas. Consumer awareness can be driven by authorities, by EPR schemes. But also we have an educational package developed at our offices in uh, Asia, which we share with children from primary school to university. Collection and sorting, huge investments and uh, will drive uh, the, the, the collection and the quality, and that will help us as a value chain. Then development of recycling. As mentioned, we already make steps at our company. We move from bottle recycling. We also developed tray-to-tray recycling already. And because we and our colleagues uh, managed to do that, actually the good news is that the clear mono tray here in Sweden from April will be considered recyclable. So that will help you all as brand owners because I think you're going to have a differentiated EPR fee. Technologies. We, chemical recycling, we are partnering with the likes of Carbios and Ionica, for example, to develop new technologies for PT, which is not mechanically recyclable. And we turn it back into feedstock for new, clear PT feedstock for packaging. Holy Grail project. Maybe some of you have heard of that. It's about digital watermarking. Matthias can tell you all about how difficult it is to sort out many different products in many different new streams. A digital watermarking we see as a high potential. Uh, to, to, to bring us new sorting opportunities. Such like, for example, also artificial intelligence. And the external factors here is something that we as an industry work on uh, together with the likes of business organizations like Petcore and Plastic Recyclers Europe. So what are we at Indorama Ventures now doing? So uh, let me summarize. Uh, we are working on the infrastructure together with partners and we collaborate with the people and the organizations in the value chain to create the best possible array of recycling solutions uh, for both our suppliers, the collection schemes, as well as our customers. And we do that with various products, mechanical recycling, advanced recycling, SPS, and we even have a sustainable brand, which is called Deja. And I think I've seen the slide before. Seems like a deja vu. So some key takeaways. So PET will support the alignment and, 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 uh, towards uh, achieving our climate targets, but it will need to be recycled. And of course, PET has been by history the one that's been recycled already for a long, long time. But it can always be done better. And for that, we rely on the whole value chain. People need to throw it away in a decent way like at, at the PMD, in the, in, the, in, the, in the decent collection system. Uh, the collection system needs to be organized well, etc. We as recyclers need to be on top. And then, of course, there still needs to be a demand from the brand owners and not rely only on whether it fits with the current economics. And in the Rama, we contribute to solutions to drive this supply of recycled content by our PET product design, by working on sorting technologies and recycling technologies. And we are very much open to partnering with everybody in the value chain uh, to achieve this full circularity. And with that, I would like to close with what we call our purpose, reimagining chemistry together to create a better world. I think we all have to do it together to make the steps forward. We believe in what we do. And we believe that the customer does not only buy our product, they buy what we believe ourselves. And what we believe is that PET is the best and the most circular material for lightweight packaging on bottles and trays. And together we can achieve our sustainable goals for 2025 20, uh, and 2030 onwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willem, uh, for that very interesting uh, presentation. Uh,
you are also welcome back on stage when the panel discussion starts in the end of this session. Uh, and an applause have already been given, but uh, once again, very much thank you. Uh, we will now uh, move on uh, to Konstantin Damov. Uh, Konstantin, you are welcome up on the stage. Uh, Konstantin is the co-founder and chairman of uh, Green Group. And uh, Mr. Damov will tell us a lot about recycling of uh, colored PET bottles. So Mr. Damov, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear friends, I'm very happy to be here, coming from uh, uh, Far East Europe, from Romania, all the way. And uh, probably some people will wonder, what should I tell you? So uh, I have to tell you that we are in this business of recycling 20 years uh, now, and we have been developing, uh, I would say, interesting and successful uh, network uh, regional in the Eastern uh, Europe. Now, uh, Green Group. Green Group, yes, we have a few business lines. One is plastics. We are uh, recycling uh, PET, LDP, and PP. We have uh, developed electronic waste uh, recycling uh, industry, and we are recycling everything from small batteries to big appliances. Glass packaging and uh, flat glass recycling. And we also have uh, some environmental services we are uh, giving in uh, Romania, Lithuania and Slovakia. These are the areas we are present with uh, our industry uh, for recycling. Our total uh, capacity, our input is uh, 500,000 tons a year. And uh, we have today nine companies, uh, nine recycling plants, and we have uh, 3,000 plus uh, employees. Okay, today is a bad day, so let's speak about uh, PET. And uh, actually, I won't go to the whole history or, or what uh, we are doing. I'm going straight to some trials we did with Swedish plastic recycling, so it's not so much about us, but about our cooperation with the Swedish plastics. Okay, here, uh, speaking about plastic division, uh, the company is called Green Tech inside the group. And uh, as we said, we have uh, 150,000 tons input. And we have Green Tech Romania, Green Tech Slovakia, and Green Tech Baltic. What we produce out of the uh, PET input, uh, we can uh, deliver 70,000 tons of PET flakes. And uh, we are producing staple fiber polyester. 45,000 tons a year. We are also producing packaging. PET strap, 7,000 tons a year. And uh, also our pet, uh, approximately uh, 15,000 tons uh, a year. Well, I should say that all our products uh, have uh, only recycled content. We don't use any virgin material. And also we have been very much focused on a CO2 footprint. And uh, in the case of a PET product like uh, fiber and uh, strap, we calculate our CO2 footprint and uh, reduction goes so far as a 70% less than virgin uh, fibers. Actually, I think we are the first uh, company in Europe that we succeed to obtain uh, green certificates for offsetting with other companies for CO2 reduction. Okay, Swedish color bottle is something that we heard is happening here, and we tried to uh, put our nose into this uh, matter, and this is how material for the first test uh, was looking like. 
And uh, we know that today uh, quality was improved uh, a lot in sorting, but for our test, that how material uh, reaching our site was looking like. So we start in uh, 2021, cooperation for color PET bottles, and we tested a quantity of 18.48, actually is one truck of uh, color PET bottles, just to get some uh, results. You can see here uh, the quality of bottle we found in the bale, uh, we also find also other material that we had to separate, like uh, uh, PS, uh, some paper, um, things that uh, I understood from materials that they have been reduced a lot and the quality of material, it's, uh, it's uh, much better. What we got out of that? Flakes, after we have been, it's a mechanical recycling, like was told before, and this is how the uh, flakes look like. It's a floral, we call, uh, the color is floral. Then you'll see it's a light floral. You'll see on the left, in the middle is a floral which is more like uh, bluish. And uh, the one on the right, it's uh, very reddish. So, <laughs> we start from these uh, colors and we try to find application to use this material uh, into a finished product. So, the results of uh, the conclusion on quality on color bottle bales was that the color variation is the one that is creating uh, difficulties for the finished product. Uh, and I will say you uh, at the end uh, where we went with this, uh, uh, I will say, difficulty. Uh, we realized that such material we could accept in our facilities uh, like a 300 tons. We got a good quality A, B and some C. It's a positive development and we, what we can produce is a PET strap and a low-grade uh, fiber. Okay, for the trays, this is how they look. I will go, uh, it will be like uh, 220 tons we have been processing and uh, we have been going to some uh, analysis and uh, I want to show you that what we got was like a 80% uh, trays, 20% impurities. We made also the oven test and we've seen, due to uh, multi-layers, a little bit of yellowish um, change of the, uh, of the color. And we went even to the level of uh, um, regranulated, so you can see the crystallized pellets, they look quite good. Okay, so PET tray is a challenging process. And uh, what we found was uh, more organic uh, content uh, on the dry trommel. Or the optical sorter had been rejecting the black trays, which are not really good for uh, the process. What the treatment was quite uh, difficult because of biocontamination. And uh, we also realized that we can have for the application even up to 20% of multi-layer. I think this is uh, uh, some news. Uh, and I will uh, tell you that, uh, was say that nothing is black and uh, white. One of the application, it's a fiber, which I have it here, which is gray. It's not black and it's not white. It's difficult to have a, a, a clear a white uh, fiber also black fiber, it's very demanding. So uh, this application looks like a good one and uh, it goes to automotive industry, is going to furniture, is going to carpet and uh, uh, so on. And at the end, uh, I want to thank you for inviting uh, uh, me here. And I will say that uh, from uh, Romania Green Group, 12 votes are going to Sweden. <laughs> Swedish plastic recycling. Thank you. Thank you for the 12 points, uh, Konstantin, and for the great presentation on, uh, on how you have tested our materials, both uh, colored PET bottles and PET trays.
Uh, after the next speaker, you are also welcome back uh, on stage for the uh, questions uh, to be asked. Uh, and uh, we will uh, now proceed and we will invite uh, Matisse, uh, M- Matthijs uh, Fierman uh, on stage. Welcome up on stage, Matthijs. Uh, Matthijs is uh, working as a business development manager uh, at Morsenkoff Plastics. And uh, you will also talk about PET recycling. Uh, so please go on. Thank you. Thank you also for uh, for the invitation for today to tell you a little bit about uh, myself very shortly, the company and uh, our activities in in PET recycling. Uh, to start with myself, indeed, I'm uh, uh, involved in business development at at Marsinkov uh, Rimoplast, and besides that, I'm also trying to make a little bit of a contribution by participating in industrial organizations like being a co-chairman of uh, NRK Recycling, the Dutch Plastic Recycling Association, um, and also being in the advisory board of the Dutch version of uh, FTI, Afalfonds, and a member of the Dutch steering committee of the Plastic Pact. Um, to give you a little bit of background about our company, so we are Morsing of Rimoplast, a group nowadays of 11 plastic recycling companies active in the European market and already having quite a long history in, uh, in recycling, actually since 1961 when Mr. Gerti Morsinkov started the company. Um, in the meantime, his three sons are managing uh, the company, Eric Rolf and Stefan, each with their own specific activities in the business. And there is also a Swedish connection to Morsenkov Rimoplast, as IKEA is since 2017 a 15% minority shareholder in our company. The end products that we produce as a recycler are regrinds, regranulates, and compounds. And the annual production across uh, materials like HDPE, LDPE, polypropylene, polystyrene, and PET are currently 400,000 tons uh, per year. And one third of that, roughly 125,000 tons, is uh, PET recycled raw material. And always with the focus to do it in closed loops, so to bring back the raw material in the original application. Of course, of very big importance for us is that we work with great partners in the supply of material and also at the back end uh, of of our recycling process. And we are happy and proud that since 2008, at the very early stage of Swedish plastic recycling, we are already in contact. And we started in 2019 uh, with the recycling of HDPE and polypropylene sorted packaging from the Swedish uh, system. Um, again, there we are uh, doing our utmost to close loops on high-end uh, applications. So by intensive mechanical recycling processes, we sort on color, we grind, we cold wash, we uh, hot wash, we pelletize, we deodorize. And from that uh, recycling raw material uh, results that can be reused in HDPE bottles, for example, for home and personal care applications. And more in the area of IKEA, our Swedish connection, uh, we also recycle polypropylene. Again, intensive process, color sorting, cold washing, hot washing, extrusion, deodorizing for reusage of polypropylene, either in new packaging or in consumer household items. Um, here you see a couple of examples of the uh, raw materials that we produce. In the case of the pellets, these are the four grades of HDPE that we produce. So without any addition of master batch, purely the recycled raw material. And the end applications like shampoo bottles pr- put on the market by companies like Unilever, Biasdorf. And in the case of polypropylene, um, uh, Biasdorf with a nice example of a, a, a cream, which is uh, the outside of the, uh, the jar is made out of 100% recycled PP and the Swedish Holbar connection, um, uh, the recycle bin that is uh, in your kitchen covered. Again, out of 100% post-consumer packaging. Of course, we are also active in, in PET, the theme of, uh, of today. Um, we are active in uh, specifically in bottle-to-bottle recycling originally, and of course, we'll go to the tray uh, later on. Bottle-to-bottle recycling we do since 1997, actually originally also in a combination together with uh, Wellman uh, recycling. Um, so out of, out of 100% post-consumer feedstock, we produce a recycled raw material that can be reused again up to 100% in new packaging bottles for the uh, for food contact of course 
Uh, we produce that with our own technology. It's a unique set of combination of different technologies which take care of intensive mechanical and also chemical cleaning of the recycled PET. Um, out of that results a raw material which has consistent properties in terms of color, in terms of mechanical properties and still enables customers to proceed with their light weighting uh, adventures, I would almost uh, say. Um, Again, some nice examples on the screen. Coca-Cola has been using our material for many years in 100% applications. Uh, Ribena, actually the uh, brand from the UK since 2008. So uh, long before recycled PET, I think was known in bottle to bottle and even thought of 100% usage, they already uh, proven it. And also a nice example to mention is the green bottle produced purely out of green uh, collected post-consumer bottles. Um, we also grow in PET recycling, so I think we've seen today many examples of companies uh, expanding. Uh, we have done the same since a couple of years we are producing in our factory in, in Germany, besides our activities that we already had in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, producing currently 40,000 tons of recycled PET there and expanding later this year to 80,000 tons of uh, our pet production. And the growth doesn't stop there because we will also start a new factory in Belgium, in uh, the southern part of the uh, of Belgium, Neuf Chateau, uh, where a production will start per the end of 2024, again with a production capacity of around about 40,000 tons, uh, not only in clear bottles, not only in the uh, colored bottles, but also in PET trays. Actually, a process that we already apply in our existing facility in the Netherlands as well. Um, the facility in Belgium, as you can see, is quite an expensive, uh, expen uh, how do you say it? Uh, expensive as well, but also a quite uh, expensive and ex uh, uh, process uh, of a combination of mechanical and uh, enhanced recycling. And on this uh, part of enhanced recycling, I will come back a little bit later. Uh, PET trays, of course, a very important packaging format, uh, also based on what we as consumers, uh, how we develop in terms of convenience. We would like to spend less time, apparently, for uh, shopping groceries, preparing dinner, and then a PET packaging is an ideal format to package your, your food. And the same goes for uh, uh, the size of households becoming smaller, more small portion packaging uh, on the market, which is not only convenient, but also helpful in reducing uh, and avoiding food waste, which is mu much more impactful than uh, the CO2 emissions of uh, plastic packaging. But of course, putting so much packaging on the market comes with challenges. Um, I think we heard it uh, before, that there is the plastic debate, there is the, uh, the climate change. We need to make sure as an industry, uh, as a supply chain, that we collect, sort and recycle PET trays. This has been limited until now and there's uh, uh, luckily a lot of effort going on to, uh, uh, to change that. Um, PET tray recycling comes with, with challenges. It's not, not that easy. Uh, we already heard the story about mono and multi-layer trays. We see printed packaging on the market. We see labels being applied on uh, packaging. We see absorption uh, pads uh, to remove moisture. We see a variety of colors in, uh, in, in packaging. And not, uh, not unimportant to mention is that in terms of uh, food legislation for applying recycled raw material back into food packaging, a challenge is also that trays are a combination of food and non-food packaging. And I think Constantine also already mentioned uh, that uh, the PET trays also come with a high level of uh, organic contamination. A lot of the, the issues I mentioned before are solvable by design for, uh, for recycling. And I think there is also a challenge for the front end of the, uh, of the supply chain. Uh, there is already a, a lot of knowledge and Swedish plastics recycling helps to expand uh, that, that knowledge. But at the same time, studies of the Dutch University of Twente have uh, proven that, uh, or highlighted at least, that choice of materials in terms of design for recycling is too often still made by marketeers and design agencies being decisive in, in the choice of material. Um, and on top of that, sustainability is not always top of list. Costs, restrictions of using certain packaging machines of, uh, which have been invested in before, and also time to market are limiting factors in applying sustainability in the design of a packaging. Uh, also not unimportant to mention is that uh, the focus until now always has been on reduce, reduce and reduce. Uh, not always thinking correctly about the impact of light weighting and packaging on the recyclability. Uh, more losses and more difficult to, to clean. Um, 
the solutions are there in terms of sorting and in terms of mechanical recycling. Uh, we have seen the, the presentation of, uh, of Ricard that uh, polymer, color and mono and multi-layer sorting is, is done by Swedish plastic recycling, helped by different technologies out there in the market which can make res uh, the sorting perhaps a little bit easier. And of course, we as recyclers are also investing in new technologies, uh, dealing specifically with the challenges of the organic contamination and of course also the brittleness of the trays, which can create a lot of losses in terms of fines being created. Um, we've seen uh, a very similar picture in the, in the presentation of Constantine as well. Uh, we can recycle the monolayer trays, we can make a nice pallet out of it, which can be used to uh, produce a, uh, a clear tray. And luckily the market is starting to adapt uh, this new format of packaging with a slight color, which perhaps five years ago would have been a definite no-go and currently is being accepted by, by the market. But this brings some limitations as well. Uh, PET has the nature of degrading in terms of color at each recycling uh, uh, cycle. PET trays are relatively complex and therefore the risk of this decoloration is a little bit bigger uh, than, than in bottles. Um, and also in all this sorting at uh, Swedish plastic recycling and also at the mechanical recyclers, losses are created and those losses we of course ideally would like to recycle as well. And that is where enhanced recycling comes, comes into play as an add-on to, to mechanical recycling. Um, so polyester, as, as Willem already mentioned, is one of the most commonly used uh, plastics, not only in packaging, but also in clothing, fiber, and many different other applications. But in those other applications, often colorants are used, additives are used, and they contain some sorts of contaminations that by regular mechanical recycling processes cannot be taken out. And that is where enhanced recycling is of added value. Um, enhanced recycling is not to be mistaken by chemical recycling, pyrolysis, for example, as an, uh, a form of chemical recycling. It's an intermediate step between mechanical and chemical recycling. Um, in our case, it's a partial depolymerization, and that partial depolymerization enables us to filter out um, multi-materials, uh, to microfiltrate based on, on particles to be taken out, to take out colorants, um, and then rebuild a polymer that can be reused purely in uh, food packaging, uh, clear applications again. Um, of course, one of the downsides of definitely of chemical recycling, uh, but let's say a more enhanced advanced recycling as such is that it's related to more energy usage. And we have done quite an extensive CE Delft uh, a study, uh, LCA study, that has proven that uh, despite the fact that the cure technology in our case has a little bit more uh, energy consumption and therefore CO2 emission uh, than mechanical recycling, it's still way better than virgin production and still way better than the impact of regular chemical uh, recycling. Where are we in this process of enhanced recycling? We started in 2018. Uh, in 2020, we opened a pilot plant where we are doing a lot of trials on, on different materials um, and are currently trying different ways of uh, decontaminating the PET, which will result in a demonstration plant of 25 kilotons, uh, which will be operational by the end of uh, next year. And of course, all those developments, you cannot do it alone as a company or as a small consortium of companies. You need uh, partners. And in this particular case, Coca-Cola is helping us out uh, massively uh, financially, but also with all their knowledge, they uh, support us in bringing this enhanced recycling to, to market. Of course, in their strive to put 100% recycled PET and or sustainable raw material back, uh, back in the market. So to, to conclude, uh, the enhanced recycling can be a great add-on to what we already do in uh, mechanical recycling by processing waste streams which are simply not uh, uh, suitable for mechanical recycling alone, or better said, the output of mechanical recycling uh, cannot be reused in new applications, there is no market for it. Of course, everything that goes for bottles, it goes for trays as well, everything that can be recycled mechanically and can be put back in the original application, please mechanically recycle it. Advanced recycling is of no added value uh, there. Um, at the end of the day, our strive is uh, to go to a market where 70% of all material is mechanically recycled and 30% of all material is either 
enhanced recycled or bio-based material so that 100% of the raw material mix at the end is sustainable. And until that moment that enhanced recycling is there and active, uh, as Max Verstappen I, th I think always says, let's keep pushing uh, the limits, in this case for design for recycling and also the sorting and mechanical recycling of, of PET. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthijs, for that very exciting uh, news. And it is ver looking very promising for the packaging producers here. They can put almost anything on the market in the future, it seems. Uh, uh, well, that's definitely not our strife. But uh, <laughs> uh, let's say for the ones that are not fit for purpose yet, uh, we have solutions as well. Yeah, that sounds great, I think, for many here. Uh, so we will now continue with uh, questions uh, and if you in the audience here uh, in the studio have any question, please raise your hand and I will try to, to look, uh, look here over uh, you to see if anyone have any question. Uh, otherwise I have some prepared questions. Uh, and one of the questions that I have is uh, about, we didn't mention that much about deposit systems. Um, I think that some of you are involved in deposit systems already. Um, and in, in, in Sweden, I have heard discussions that if the material goes into a depo deposit system, the material should stay uh, like in that industry. At the same time, we have some uh, of you who turn some of the materials into uh, other applications than the, the bottle. Uh, application. Uh, what is your view on this? Uh, I think that you all are involved in yeah. some cases in, in uh, deposit systems. So please, Matthijs, you can start. Um, yeah, actually, we are in favor of, of, of closed uh, deposit systems where uh, brand owners remain owner of, of the bottles that they put on, on the market. Um, in many ways, I think that is a good development. A, uh, because they have an obligation uh, by 2040 to include 65% of recycled content. If they are not the owner of, of the waste uh, stream, how, uh, uh, how to get access to that, to that material. So that is already uh, uh, an important factor. And uh, one of the comments that is, pops up every now and then in terms of recycling is, what is the price of recycled raw material? And the price of recycled raw material, specifically bottles, is sometimes driven up by demand from not only bottles, but also other applications. If you have closed systems for deposit bottles, where the brand owner remains owner of the feedstock, there is no price discussion anymore. You need a converter that converts the post-consumer bottle to a recycled PET, and the commercial factor is taken out of the equation, and nobody can ever say anymore that uh, uh, to not use any recycled material because it's more expensive than uh, the alternative, which in this case could be virgin material. Yeah. Thank you, Matthijs. Uh, do uh, Konstantin want to add anything uh, in this discussion on, on deposit systems and keeping the materials in, in a specific application? What is your view on it? Of course, how much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> you can no, get uh, one uh, or two minutes on it. Two minutes, okay. Uh, well, I agree that uh, this is a very circular model. So uh, they are selling the use, they don't sell the packaging. So it remains forever property of the filler. Uh, and of course, in such a situation, uh, recycling industry is becoming a service. So we, at least a green group, we uh, humble approach this uh, uh, system like uh, we are the service for the big industries to keep the material, keep moving uh, in, the, in the system. Of course, uh, we'll find because many companies uh, smaller, they have to uh, be different from uh, large companies. Not all will stay with uh, clear bottles. Uh, in Eastern Europe, we have a lot of brown and green for uh, beer. Uh, yes, surprising. And uh, at the end will be material that will be difficult to go for our so other solution of extending the life or finding a upcycling or whatever we call it, but uh, any good solution should be also part of uh, DRS. So I believe it, it will be a conversion, but also a part has to go for other application, not necessary closed loop. And Willem, I think that you are also uh, excited about getting the same question, so uh, please. <laughs> um, I think what's most important is that 
whatever system it is, whether it's a DRS or whether it's a non-DRS EPR, every bottle and every packaging should be coming back and become available for recyclers for us to process it back into new raw material. So I'm a bit neutral in there. Uh, I think that, that this availability is point one. The second part is that the whole chain, and Matthijs already explained a little bit, should be economically, be economically viable. Hmm. And that, that's just key. Because the, the cost of the system, whether it's a closed loop, whether uh, recyclers are free to sell it uh, uh, to whatever customer po portfolio they have, it will be key that the cost of the circular system will be borne by the whole system. Hmm. And that's how circularity has to work. Costs are not just at one place, but borne by everybody involved. And that, that's going to be uh, important, I think. Yes. Matthias, you represent uh, the EPR scheme uh, here in, in Sweden for plastic packaging. What is your view on this topic? Well, uh, I have to say clearly that we have a very good uh, deposit system in Sweden. It's working very well. Uh, so those bottles that we actually receive, we shouldn't have received them, many of them. But it's a good thing for the consumer and for the companies as well to know that we will also take care of them and recycle them and hopefully let them be new uh, PET bottles. Yep. Uh, other <coughs> than that, I don't have too much to, to add to those experts. Thank you. Perhaps one thing to add, I think, uh, the whole concept of uh, a deposit system where a brand owner puts material on the market, gets recycled PET back, I think at the end of the day is a great example also how, uh, let's say, an EPR system like Swedish Plastic Recycling could work, where brand owners could get more directly involved in systems and see that the material they put on the market, they pay a fee for the service to collect, sort and recycle, that they can have access to recycled raw material again. So I think this whole concept that could be inspiring for... Uh, uh, other parts of the plastics industry than PET bottles as well. Mm. I think we uh, have uh, answered that question. Do we have anything from the audience? Anyone who wants to ask everything you have been thinking about PET packaging for the last month or maybe last hour? Uh, if you're not thinking about PT packaging all the time. I know that you're asking me a lot of questions <laughs> about PT packaging. So I'm a little bit confused if no one raises their hand in the audience and I will continue with my questions otherwise. But uh, please, now I th see that Torkel wants to ask, ask something. So we will make sure he has a mic now. Uh, he is hi, Torkel Bergen, uh, former dairy, now plastics production. But uh, I was thinking about the new PET trays and lids and cups uh, sorting and uh, recycling. Because I know since before it was not easy to recycle them really because of contaminants on leading films and uh, laminates and, uh, and uh, maybe residues of products. But are we now going to have them recycled in a closed loop when we use PET for lids and trays if they are clear? Thank you. A very good question. We can start uh, at uh, Matthias, I think, uh, who is responsible for doing the sorting of them. Uh, how do you see on this uh, question? You have the PT trays that are right. uh, have for a long time been sorted in Motala, but not been sent for recycling. And what is? You're already given the answer. Uh, yeah? Let me. <laughs> Sorry. I, so uh, <laughs> the 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 plant that we are operating at the moment uh, that is expanding to become site zero, it was actually designed uh, to be able to sort out transparent uh, pet trays. Uh, so we, we have actually been doing that for a long time and been testing that with, with uh, many different actors. And uh, last year was basically the moment where we found a suitable solution that we uh, actually were, were there to be able to uh, close the loop. And this is, of course, uh, very encouraging. And uh, yes, I would say that, that we have uh, created a closed loop for transparent pet trays. Yes. Can and I ask another question, not on PET, but if you say, for example, that uh, you have <coughs> closed loops for personal care products for HDPE, mm. would you see it it's possible? Uh, if I would like to buy such for food contact materials, I guess it's not available anywhere. 
Uh, indeed, uh, good good question. Good uh, <laughs> same reaction. Uh, how much time do you have? Because because uh, it can be quite an extensive answer. Um, let's summarize it to the, to the fact that European legislation, although Europe is pushing towards uh, circularity, pushing for more use of recycled raw material. Um, the uh, strictness of rules in terms of uh, food contact, recycled raw materials for food packaging, um, the strictness level is high. PET is an ideal material to bring back into food for chemical uh, and treatment uh, reasons, which is more difficult to achieve with, uh, with HDPE and, and polypropylene. But um, let's say that the new legislation with novel technology might create some openings that can be used in the near future to also bring back polyolefins back into food packaging. Yeah, thank you, because not everything is possible to produce out of PET. Indeed. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I I I, uh, I see that uh, Willem wants to to add something yeah, we, here on the, we, these well, topics. We move to 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 the uh, to the other plastics quickly. So I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more on the PT trays. So whilst in some cases, uh, like here in the Motala, uh, the, the 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 sorting was started pretty pretty early. There are many countries where PT trays are not or not yet in a very good manner are sorted. Um, <clears throat> so it was sorted here, and, and I think in collaboration with us all, uh, basically, uh, a, a decent quality has been uh, developed uh, in the extensive sorting process. So it actually means that uh, of the clear PT uh, tray stream, so I have to say clear, because if you put in all the funky colors, it's, it's, it's not going to be returning back into the packaging, uh, as uh, Constantine also said. Um, so of those clear... PT uh, trays for the mono tray, actual tray to tray is possible uh, already technically. So uh, that's already what's commercially happening at the moment. So uh, if that was a question, is there any tray flake available to make a new clear PT tray with a decent amount of tray RPAT content? The answer is definite yes. So. <laughs> Yeah. I also can confirm that the quality of tray to tray uh, was accepted, I won't give the names here, but by uh, large companies in Europe and uh, they qualify the result like a good one. Yeah. And I will say again that uh, the quality of sort, a good sorting quality is guaranteeing a good recycling results. Yeah. So what uh, uh, is happening in Motola, it's an example how sorting should uh, go and uh, secure pure materials in order for uh, good uh, results. Yeah. Mm. Perhaps uh, uh, only one addition. I think it's also a matter of market awareness and market readiness. So I think the uh, the tray producers and the retailers taking packaged uh, products in trays realize that they need to go into recycling of trays to keep this a sustainable f uh, packaging uh, format. Mm. And also market readiness. Uh, you've seen, I think, the tray that Constantine uh, had in his presentation, the tray that I had in my presentation. It is slightly more yellow than perhaps a tray which would be produced out of bottle flakes. But uh, when the market is ready to accept that a tray might look a little bit different than it used to be two years, five, ten years ago, then we can also take as recyclers the next steps to keep investing in, uh, uh, in capacities. And the yellowing effect of the PET that is being recycled, what would you say is the cause of the yellowing effect? Uh, of course, PET, when being reprocessed, has the nature of uh, discoloration and uh, reprocessing can be in, in, ex in an extrusion line uh, for making sheet, can be in a uh, recycling extrusion line, so it's inherent to the, to the material. And uh, the more complex a packaging is, uh, the more particles that create this, yellow, uh, this yellowing uh, will, be, will be present. So it can be a multi-layer uh, uh, material, but it can also be other factors that create this, uh, this yellowing. I think uh, Konstantin uh, had a picture on this uh, in uh, called the oven test that can be made to, to, to see how m much of yellowing effect you have on a recycled material. Uh, so can you also comment a little bit yes. more about this? It also may come from the multi-layer has not only PET. Mm -hmm. So we might have like a barrier for oxygen yeah. Uh, that is, uh, I don't know, can be polyamide or can be uh, polyethylene and uh, at the different temperatures 
of melting and uh, we can see a yellowish uh, turning uh, color where especially uh, for uh, by presence of the multilayer uh, trace mm. in the in the whole uh, packaging it will be very difficult to separate uh, totally but uh, we understood the new technology just appeared and the multilayer and the single layer can be now separated we're looking forward to see uh, this in Motala. <laughs> <laughs> we will see. Uh, do we have more questions from the audience? I see that we have a hand in the air, so we will just make sure that she get the microphone. Yes, okay, so I have a question. For PET packaging, if you are to mention the top three reasons, you know, designed for recycling, what would those three top be for PET packaging? To improve it, you mean? To improve design for the recycling, what yeah. would be the top three most important thing to enhance recycling of PET packaging? Well, it, it, it's always, if I may, uh, may start, it's always uh, an organic thing how it works. Sorting and recycling is always very much responsive of what's happening in the market. So, so first of all, we shouldn't look at it as like uh, only the now, but as the future. And there will always be new questions arising. Um, so, mechanically speaking, if you want to recycle PET, whether it's a tray or a bottle, uh, color is one. I can be like very straightforward. Uh, I have two kids. You have a plate of four types of paint. After 20 minutes, the plate doesn't have four colors, but it's brown. So, basically, in a mechanical process, you have all types of color. You're not going to make any clear new packaging from it. So, if you need only clear, color is definitely number one. But there are also other aspects. You could think about full screen sleeves, for example, uh, that could uh, affect the effectiveness of your sorting if the, if the bottle underneath is clear. But also the materials of sleeves, for example, can be uh, an issue. And of course, talking about layer structures, etc., for functionality. So I get it that there is a functionality uh, request there. Um, the layers can um, have, uh, let's say, a, a negative impact on uh, yeah, turning the material back into the same new packaging again. Uh, nonetheless, we've seen over the last years that, for example, Trace is a good one. Black has been phased out, and multi-layer barrier stuff is slowly getting less and less and less. So it seems that there's an increased awareness that uh, simplification of the packaging leads to a higher circularity, I would say. I, I must uh, continue on this uh, question because uh, many of the packaging producers, they need to use uh, lidding films, labels, and they are using uh, glues and or adhesives. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your view on the adhesive? How is it being uh, handled in the process? Uh, do you think that, uh, and depending on the temperature stability and the dissolution uh, properties. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on this? Uh, maybe Matthijs? Um, I'm not <laughs> that, uh, that most of the, the technical expert, I must, uh, I must admit. Of course, uh, avoid using, uh, using glues where possible is of course always the best uh, uh, solution. And what I sometimes hear in discussions on design for recycling is um, uh, neglecting the fact uh, that if you wash off a glue in a washing process, that it's um, uh, you transfer a problem. The problem is on the packaging. You wash it off, and most designers for packaging, I think, problem solved. But the problem is not longer on the packaging, but it's in the water. And of course, if you uh, certainly, uh, uh, we have been focusing on energy, but I think the next big thing, uh, big thing in uh, in Europe will be water, water availability, water cleaning, putting it back into the system. So we also should be keep thinking about uh, uh, when we put glue on and it's, uh, you can wash it off, uh, the problem doesn't end uh, there. So that's my yeah. add-on to, uh, uh, to this question. Thank you. And I think that we will come back to, uh, to this question in the, in the next uh, session. Time is uh, running out uh, and uh, I'm very happy with uh, all the presenters uh, and the work that you have done here uh, this uh, first uh, hour. We will now go for a break for 30 minutes and, and uh, we uh, will start again at uh, quarter to three. So see you back in 30 minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back. I uh, hope you all enjoyed the break. Uh, we will now continue with the uh, second session, uh, which will cover PT packaging design. And we have once again four speakers. And the first one is Hans Steyer. So welcome up on the stage, Hans. Hans works as a project manager at the uh, Rice Normpack. And Hans, the floor is yours. You will uh, talk about uh, food contact materials. So That's right. Thank you. Please, go on. Thank you for the nice introduction. My name is Hans Steyr. In, in my daily work, I'm at the Secretariat at Normpack. And we are part of RISE, the Research Institutes of Sweden. Uh, the aim for Normpack is to work for safe materials in contact with food. And today I will use the acronym FCM, uh, meaning food contact materials. Uh, these may be the starting materials you see on the picture, uh, as well as the articles like the cup, the lid and so on. Uh, FCM are mainly used for packaging, uh, but the rules also apply for all materials used for preparing or serving food. Uh, Norpak have been around for more than 40 years. We started off as an initiative from the food and packaging industry. The aim was, and still is, to set the model how to navigate the legislation for food contact materials, mainly aimed for the Swedish market. We have approximately 175 member companies. There is a steering committee led by a chairman with a background from the food packaging sector. And yesterday we held the annual meeting here in Stockholm, again for the first time after the pandemic. Uh, we had invited speakers from the Swedish food agency and the food sector. Unfortunately, the speaker from the EU Commission had to decline with short notice. Uh, and I as I said, uh, the goal is to help members navigate and meet the legislation, and by this put safe materials on the market. Uh, the foundation for Normpack is based on three blocks. Firstly, we have the Normpack norm. Uh, it's still needed because there is, are still gaps in the legislation at the entire EU level. So the norm also refers to, for example, the German recommendations to give a complete set of requirements covering all type of food contact materials. Secondly, we cannot and shall not take the legal responsibility uh, of the materials. The system relies on that each actor, actor control and self-monitor its own activities and products. However, then, as a third block, uh, Normpack may support in assessing the supporting documentation for a product or material and evaluate if it's up to date with current versions of legislation and recommendations. Uh, a membership includes guidance, uh, the possibility to follow courses. We provide newsletters, uh, approximately 10 per year. And we may hold webinars when there are sp is a specific topic to inform about. And as I mentioned, uh, the possibility to apply for NORMPAC certificates for FCM products. But uh, enough on NORMPAC then, and over to the topic of today. <coughs> I will try to give you an overview of the FCM legislation, and with focus on the new regulation on recycled plastics for food contact. Uh, but as a start, a very brief introduction for those of you new to the field. <coughs> All food contact materials are covered by the EU framework regulation, uh, and the processing and handling of them are covered by the regulation of good manufacturing practice, GMP. Uh, the framework is an umbrella for all type of FCM, and the core requirement is that FCM shall not transfer it, its constituents uh, to the food during its use in quantities that could endanger human health. It's also stated that FCM in principle shall be inert and not change the properties of the food, nor deteriorate odor or taste of the food. The intention of the framework when it came in 2004 was that there should be a specific regulations for each of the materials under it. 
Unfortunately, this has happened only for plastics and a few more. Instead, uh, there are still national regulations or recommendations that are used when assessing other materials, for example, paper and board for the EU market. There is an ongoing discussion now uh, on how to reform the system and make it work better. The principle today is to allow the use of evaluated and listed substances and put down limits for the migration into the food at the intended use. For plastics, it has worked out as intended, however, at a rather slow pace. It is the most comprehensive material-specific FCM legislation, and the so-called positive union list has more than 1,000 entries. It is also detailed on how to evaluate and test for migration. But uh, over to today's focus then, <clears throat> the new regulation sorry, for recycled plastics replaces the previous one from 2008. It has a broader scope and among other things, it's more clear on definitions and roles of different actors. Earlier also national laws applied, but this is not the case any longer. Uh, it, it's a complex regulation. Uh, and it's not possible to cover it in full during this limited time for my presentation. The purpose of this new regulation is to increase the use of rec recycled plastic content in food contact materials, and at the same time secure that the health of us is not at risk. It sets a playing field for regulate all recycling processes, both existing ones, like mechanical recycling or PET, and closed loop systems, also possible, and also possible future ones. And some general principles then on, the, on this new regulation. Um, it handles decontamination, both of chemical possible contaminants uh, and also possible microbiological contamination. The plastic that is to be recycled shall be of EU food grade. This means that it shall fulfill the rules of composition according to the Plastics Regulation 10-2011, which I talked about, for recycling of PET. This is defined as a minimum 95% shall be of FCM plastic, and only 5% fraction might be then from PET from other sources. Recycling shall be done using a suitable uh, technology or for as a startup period it might be also be done uh, using a, what we call a novel technology. I guess we touched on that in, in the previous section. Uh, there are requirements for registration both for some of the recycling actors and locations and installations. <clears throat> and there are now also rules that the recycled materials shall be assured and documented for each batch. Uh, one of the reasons for an entire new regulation was the need for clarification of concepts. First, uh, we're talking then on recycling technology, which is then a specific combination of physical or chemical concepts, principles, practices to recycle a waste stream of a certain type and collect it in a certain way into recycled plastic materials and articles of a specific type and with a specific intended use and includes a decontamination technology. And as you understand, I'm reading from the legislation now. Uh, under that, you may then apply a recycling process, <clears throat> a sequence of unit operations, pre-processing, decontamination process and post-processing. And European Food Safety Authority evaluate all of these processes and give a statement on them. Uh, but now the new thing will be that the EU Commission will then authorize them and list them. And then as the last level there would be recycling installations. And that's equipment operating at least one part of a recycling process. And this is then an example of this, describing this hierarchy uh, between technology, which is the concept, process, uh, which use the, uh, the concept, and the actual production uses units uh, using a, a process. Um, 
<coughs> this is then an example of a recycling process. It's a sequence of unit operations possible to divide into three blocks. You have the pre-processing, the decontamination process, and post-processing. Uh, when it comes to the decontamination process, is to be used according to specific instructions. Uh, for example, it has to be mixed. Uh, uh, sorry, what comes out of the decontamination process uh, is to be used then according to specific instructions as a way to meet criteria for being as clean as it needs to be for the, uh, the intended end use. Therefore, the required amount of decontamination depends on pre- and post-processing. And a recycler, uh, in the sense of this new regulation, means any, any person who applies the decontamination process. And the converter is then doing the post-processing. Uh, I realize I have to speed up a bit, but uh, <laughs> I would like to show you anyway that you, you need to possibly to be become familiar with new acronyms in, under this uh, regulation. For instance, and these are to be used then or given to you when you do the registration to this new register. And to make things even more interesting, uh, uh, there is an upcoming uh, need uh, obligation for registration of FCM actors in Sweden. <coughs> and well, you you will apply these uh, registration acronyms then for different levels due, uh, under the, the new regulation. Uh, uh, and as, you s as I mentioned before, th there will be a need then to assess your materials on a batch level and you need to issue declaration of compliances for each batch. And there will be one template then that the recycler shall use and one that the converters, the post-processor, shall use. <coughs> uh, and to wrap things up, I will just highlight that the concept of using post-consumer plastic behind a functional barrier is now under the, the scope of this new recycling regulation. And it's we can talk a lot about that, but I don't really have time for it. And it, you will also need to, to get more <laughs> familiar with the concept of a recycling scheme. And, and that is more of, of defining uh, the, the circular process, one can say. Uh, there are a lot of dates in the, in the new regulation, but uh, I would like to, to put forward to you that it's in force. So, so it's important to, to, to make yourself famili familiar uh, with this already now. And there are a lot of dates, uh, registration deadlines and so on. And that is, might be even more complicated. So I won't go into details there. So if you feel that you are affected by this, please make sure that you, you get to, to know the information about this. And as a final remark also that the regulation for good manufacturing practice will be updated <coughs> in line with this new uh, regulation. And by 10th of October 2024, collection and pre-processing operations will need to have a quality assurance system certified by an independent third party. And I think that we, <laughs> what we can expect in the future. Well, I, I maybe have one minute or so on this. It might be uh, at crossroads now. We see what, what, where we end up, in which direction. Uh, there's a lot on the legislators' table. Uh, all of these uh, 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 <laughs> different strategies. And, uh, well, the food contact sector, that's the blue fog in, in behind all of this, but uh, uh, the EU Commission has tried to box it in, in in these five boxes then. And just as a short uh, uh, reminder that on, on what we see as, as main topics here, that there be, will be a more focus on the end materials, what is actually migrating from them to the food. Um, and how is the value chain then to be uh, organized, to be able to provide the final producer with this information. 
there will be a new block into this legislation also talking about then of more of safer and sustainable alternatives. And here it might be more of the recycling uh, topics that will be covered. And th there's also mentioned the possibility of using some sort of risk assessors uh, called notified bodies in this process. Uh, if just a short take home message. The, the new regulation is about decontamination. The composition has to be FCM plastic in the, in the first place. Uh, there will be registration needed and, and this uh, new uh, thing with, with DOCs uh, issued for each batch. It will be more of a burden in the, in the start as well, yeah, at least. Uh, so, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Hans. Uh, and you are welcome back on stage in a few minutes after the next three presenters. Uh, but we give uh, Hans another applause. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Helen Williams, and Helen is uh, welcome up on stage. Uh, Helen is uh, Associate Professor in Environment and Energy Systems, uh, researcher uh, at the Center for Service Research and teacher in sustainable develop development at the Karlstad University. That's a lot of things going on. Uh, we look forward to, to your presentation, Helen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you for being here and I'm enjoying this now. Uh, I've been a researcher about packaging for the past uh, almost 20 years. And it's because I'm really concerned about what we're doing with the ecosystem. I'm really concerned about we are what we are leaving kind of future to our children. That's why I'm so grounded in the sustainable development area. I'm very fond of the concept and I realized today that there are a lot of people out there that are fond of the concept because the concept of sustainability or sustainable development are used everywhere and it's used in the most impossible ways sometimes where this concept is smeared over both unsustainable activities and other things. We need to remember that sustainable development is a concept for the world. How we use the resources safely on, on the global level. So a country, a company and definitely not a packaging can ever be sustainable as long as the world is unsustainable. That's just so you know my perspective and where I start from. The role of packaging uh, for me, when I consider it, it's more of the service. I'm more concerned about what is packaging providing out there instead of what packaging is. Both are important when we want to move forward. But to start with, what do we need to protect? What is important to protect? And this is fairly similar to what Tietra Pak's slogan is and where they started in the 50s. In order to in order to protect what's important and also do that with a limited amount of resources and in an efficient way, we see a lot of packaging formats today. It's also uh, an effect of the marketing um, activities we have and also how consumers perceive different things. But, but we see a lot of varieties today. But in order to develop better packaging, we definitely need to help each other out with the systemic perspective. And if, I, if we start with sort of the primary packaging and the impact of the primary packaging, there will always be an interaction with the product that it is support to protect. And in order to prioritize and make the best choice of the primary packaging, we need to understand the product. We also need to understand the packaging system, how the primary packaging interact with secondary and tertiary packaging. And of course, then, in order for the packaging to support that, if we talk about food, that the food is actually eaten and not wasted, we need to understand more about the consumer behavior, their needs, and what we can accomplish in a better way. 
Therefore, we also need to look at the context, like the society, because there are different ways of recycling and how society has organized that. And in order to make a more sustainable packaging, we need to also take into account how is the recycling uh, developed in the different countries. One, one different tool, so to say, that you can use in order to understand the, how much material you can use to save a product. This simple quota between the food and the packaging is one simple way of understanding where you should put your resources into. If we take, when the number is one, you have equal climate impact from the packaging as you have of the food. Me being a salsa producer, which is the one here with in glass jars, I would definitely like think oh, 50% of the climate impact comes from the packaging. We really need to do some work here in order to reduce the impact of packaging so that it doesn't take half of the impact of the product. If I'm on top here, producing meat or cheese or even rice is an example there. Products with high climate impact, where the product represent 99% of the climate impact and the packaging 1%. It's all about reducing food waste. How can you improve your packaging so that the food, the food that we have used so much resources to, that it's not wasted? So then if we move to the, the bottom part here, when we move below one and we go to like a PET bottle with water, where you have hardly no climate impact from the product itself, it's little, all of the climate impact comes from the packaging and the transport. If I'm a producer in that segment where the packaging represents such a high impact of the, the product packaging system, I would definitely start to think about, is this the right way of doing it? Uh, can we choose other packaging formats? Or do we actually need to develop better uh, business models in order to reduce this? Is it sensible in the future, in a more sustainable future, to, to package water in plastic bottle and transport them around the world? It's a question, just to think about it, how can we develop the system to be better prepared for a sus sustainable society? So, and beside then, this, that the packaging should protect what is important. Of course, we need to look more into the recycling area. This is a, a way of describing it to, to people with perhaps less knowledge about the recycling. What hurdles do a packaging face when we have emptied it at home? Therefore, I start with the f when we have an empty packaging at home, the first hurdle that they meet is that the consumer should chose to, to sort it so that it gets to the facilitate the machines that helps them to sort the different materials. So I would say the packaging uh, faces four hurdles at least. It's probably more when you go into the detail. But it's the consumer, it's the machines that uh, sort the material, it's the, the material that ends up after sorting to make sure that it is at a quality that somebody uh, wants to do something new with and, and use it. But it's also, of course, then the economic possibilities like versus the recycled material versus uh, a new material. How is that driven or forced by government and how do we look into taxes to make, in the end, that we get more material in high quality products? It's perhaps not always a packaging, but it should be at higher quality than we see today. And I just, uh, I made a simple, like, if, to, to think about this with recyclability and circularity and the potentials. If we today, for some materialities, calculate with pretty high numbers that 80% manage the first step with the consumer in the household, that 80% is sorted in the right way. We move to the next, the machines that sort at 80% can go to the, the right, yeah, can move on to, to become a new material. 
and that 80% of that material in the end becomes a new material that is put into a product. That means in this scenario when we calculate 80% 80, 80 times 83 times, we end up with 51.2% of what we put in comes out after this measurements. Uh, this for me is not, I'm not talking down about, I mean, I, I like circularity, we need circularity, but circularity is only one of the solutions to move towards sustainable development and not the solution. It's only one of them. If we want to end up in 80% 80 80 when we do this calculation, we need 93% in all of these steps to end up at 80%. So this, in the society, for at least handling the first step then, and there is where I've done most of my studies, we need to understand consumer behavior more. It's a lot about, I've been interviewing people in their homes, doing observations, and... Uh, one of our studies, uh, it's a small study, it's an explorative study with households with high education, households that are committed to sustainable development. Um, what we found was that the obstacles that the consumers are facing can be sorted into three themes. We have first the consumer uncertainty about what is the best option from environmental reason. The second obstacle that they experience is the effort they need to take in order to make the material clean and in order to sort the different parts of a packaging. That's an effort, it takes energy, and many consider it as a little bit annoying. And the third theme then would be the attitude towards how clean it is. And I want to say like, if consumers experience something as disgusting, they, it's so easy for them to waste it right away because the disgust factor is really high. Below, here in the different uh, squares, you can see an asterisk. And that is the functions that you actually can change a little bit in new designs, how to accomplish a better packaging that makes it easier for the consumer to sort them. Um, on the product level then, what does that mean? And if you then look at this roll pack in plastic with a refillable strawberry jam, all consumer wasted that product right away because it's sticky, it's difficult to make clean, it's also little material, so they don't see, it's not worth putting the effort into this, but it has a low value. The other one, I think it's more interesting because it's the same packaging, but with two different products. It's milk in one and it's yogurt in the other. There are more consumer that will recycle the milk packaging versus the yogurt packaging. So the product makes a huge difference in how they make it. Because the yogurt is sticky, it requires water, and then the consumers start thinking like, how much water can I use in order, or is it better for the environment that we combust it? And they start to think about these environmental implications. That could also, I mean, be used for PET trays, if you think about it, like a PET tray that's been used for in the vegetable fruit area is probably more likely to be sorted by the consumer than the tray for chicken because it's sticky and a lot of consumer would consider it at, at a little bit disgusting because it's been meat in the packaging. Therefore, it's important to, to think about this. What I see today when I listen to, uh, to politicians, to, to companies and to what's going on, when we talk about circularity and sustainable development, there's a lot of greenwashing. Um, we pretend that it's better out there than it actually is. I wish for, wish for sensibility in this area, that we, that we try to communicate in a more view the systemic system, communicate the complexity, how difficult it is, but we are taking steps that move us in the right direction. 
therefore we need transparency and not this talk about this is a, a circular material. If it's not recycled in the end, then it doesn't matter that you talk like this. So I would really like us to, to be better, to do better here. And of, we also need to be humble in this sense because it is such a complex area and with a, a goal that is the goal of sustainable development is always changing a little bit so we have to be I mean confident that we are striving but not too uh, ignorant that we are already there that is what I wished for for me the future what is important think about what is important to protect. I am certain that the future requires more priorities. What should we protect and what should we actually stop doing? There's a lot of things that we need to stop in order to, to transform to sustainable development. We need the systemic perspective. Uh, we need to understand consumer and behavior. What are they doing? And that's also then the contextual thing, like what do we understand about how we do it here? That requires huge amount of collaboration. If you want to know more, there are studies out there and also a pretty new report that summarizes our research for the past years. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, uh, for a very interesting presentation. I think it's good for us to understand that it is not always about recycling. For me it is, but uh, for others it could be other things also that are important. So we will uh, continue uh, and with the next presenter. It is uh, Sean-Emil uh, Pot uh, Potofeu. Uh, I have uh, asked him how to pronounce it. I, I hope I uh, did it correct. Um, uh, Sean Emil is working as a technical manager at uh, Plastic uh, Plastic Recyclers Europe and uh, Recyclos, and uh, you will uh, explain a little bit about design for recycling, a very complex uh, area uh, I know, and uh, we are looking forward to giving, getting a crash course in design for recycling. So Sean Emil, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be present today here to talk a bit about uh, Recyclas. So I'm Jean-Emil Potofeu, indeed. I'm technical manager at Plastic Recyclers Europe, fully dedicated to Recyclas, where I'm in charge of the PET and the Pure Films Technical Committee in particular. But for those of you who are not aware about uh, what Recyclas is, Recyclas is a technical uh, cross-industry initiative uh, that, is um, that is advancing recyclability, uh, bringing transparency to the origin of plastic waste, as well as establishing harmonized, uh, let's say, harmonized uh, approach toward recycled, uh, toward recycled plastic traceability and uh, calculations. Saying this, that means making plastic, and in particular plastic packaging, more circular. I would like there to emphasize something that was said already many times uh, already, but just a brief word about the uh, current and future legislation in Europe. You are all aware about the packaging, packaging waste uh, regulation proposal currently under discussion, but I would like to insist on three deadlines, if I can say so. Uh, the first one is in 2025, which I would like to remind is in less than two years, uh, where all the PET beverage bottles will need to contain at least 25% of recycled content. If we look a bit further in the future, in 2030, there, all the plastic packaging must be recyclable and they will all need to contain a certain amount of recycled content as well. So to support us in this, let's say, uh, circularity journey, Recyclas can count today on more than 80 members that are, uh, let's say, uh, dispersed across the full plastic packaging value chain. So that means uh, from raw material producers to converters, brand owners and some retailers as well. And we have as well uh, close to 20 uh, supporters currently that are here to support uh, us in this work uh, based on their expertise. And there I would like indeed to emphasize that uh, Swedish Plastic Recycling and FTI are part of them, uh, making them really Sweden one of the front runners when talking about circularity. 
And when we talk about circularity and making plastic packaging circular, uh, Rosiklas believes that this will uh, be done through harmonization. Harmonization in terms of recommendation on how to make a packaging, uh, let's say, uh, recyclable, uh, but also in terms of certification and in terms of legislation, as I just mentioned before. And this harmonization needs to be based on facts. It needs to be scientific-based. Um, there, this is really the key to give a credible message to the full industry and uh, to provide, let's say, an efficient communication between companies, but also to the consumers at one level. And this uh, is how, uh, let's say, uh, Rossiklas see uh, his objectives. And talking about Rossiklas, we can define it as, uh, I would say, a toolbox for the uh, plastic packaging industry, where we can find uh, recyclability evaluation protocols that were, uh, that were developed uh, in the past years. These protocols are here to uh, generate data and give recommendations that are then reported in our design for recycling guidelines or in our free online tool, for those of you who are aware of it. And in addition to this, we have, of course, certifications that we developed, one for uh, recyclability and two for recycled content and recycled plastic uh, traceability. So, enough speaking about Recyclas. Let's talk a bit more about uh, what Recyclas is doing for the PET. As I was mentioning there, uh, the idea is to uh, have a fact-based approach. So, that means really performing lab testing in order to evaluate how plastic packaging features such as barriers, additive, adhesives, additives uh, are impacting the quality of the recyclate or are impacting the recycling process. There we are based on, let's say, the current state of the art recycling uh, process in Europe. With this data generated, we can then give recommendations that are there reporting in our design for recycling guidelines and then reflected in our certification and, uh, let's say, self-assessment online tool. So, talking about the PET more particularly, we, uh, as Recyclas, are endorsing today two recyclability evaluation protocols that were respectively developed by EPBP, so the European Platform for uh, PET Beverage Bottles, and uh, Petcore Europe, uh, that are addressed to PET bottles and PET trays, respectively. In addition to this, you can find several quick test procedures that are here to uh, target more specific features. For instance, uh, is the ink of the packaging bleeding or is the adhesive uh, washable uh, during the, the washing process of the, uh, PET, uh, way, um, uh, of the PET washing treatment? I highlighted there as well uh, the sorting protocol that uh, Rossiklas have in place uh, that can be performed in some uh, recycling lines. Uh, this is indeed at least as important as uh, the recyclability because if you make all the effort to make a packaging design for recycling, then it needs at least to reach the recycler. So that means that during the sorting step, we should not have any negative effect related to the shape, related to the decoration, or related to the composition of the packaging. Talking about the PET bottles, uh, there, as we are talking about circularity, the objective is indeed to go for a bottle-to-bottle -bottle approach. So here, uh, Rossiklas and DPBP uh, signed the cooperation agreement uh, a bit more than a year ago uh, that now uh, leaves Rossiklas as uh, being in charge of managing all the testing and uh, applications that are dedicated to the PET uh, bottles. So that means that if tomorrow your company, for instance, is uh, developing a new barrier solution or if it's developing a uh, new additive and you want to assess how, uh, what will be the impact on the recycling of this element, then you can contact Recyclas and with the support of our recognized testing facilities, we can make this project all together. Of course, EPBP is still present as a support and is in particular in charge of developing new protocols uh, to target, for instance, new, new features. Uh, 
Here you can see an example of the design for recycling guidelines that we developed. Uh, here it's the one for transparent, clear and light blue PET bottles. We have another one for colored PET bottles, as you understood uh, from the previous presentation, that this is also a valuable uh, stream uh, when talking about PET. And uh, EPBP is also uh, currently uh, developing, let's say, new guidelines as well for another, let's say, alternative stream for PET bottle that is the opaque uh, PET stream. As Recyclast is uh, willing to be, let's say, a transparent initiative, there uh, I would like to present you a bit the work plan that we have in our PT technical committee for this year. And in particular, I would like to insist on three points. The first one that was also, I think, raised as a question in the audience in the previous, sec uh, in the previous session is related to the yellowing uh, causes of ARPET. Indeed, uh, I mean, if we want to go for circularity, PET bottles will need not only to close the loop once, but several times. And we are all aware that PET tends to yellow with, I mean, the different uh, recycling loops. But of course, this yellowing in some, I, mean, I would say, in uh, some cases can be avoided or limited. And there I'm in particular thinking about the presence of some elements such as some adhesive, some uh, barriers elements like polyamide, uh, for instance, or some specific additives as well. So here it is really important to determine which are the root cause of this yellowing and then to give recommendation to the industry on maybe which features to avoid or which one to use in order to limit as much as possible this yellowing effect. And then that means also to uh, ensure that we can go through as many cycles as possible with these uh, PT uh, bottles. The, just to note that uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, work will be done also in cooperation with our uh, colleague from the US in APR uh, in order to, uh, let's say, uh, join our efforts. The second uh, point I wanted to highlight here today is related to soluble and washable adhesives. Indeed, uh, talking about adhesives, pressure sensitive labels, for instance, there uh, we are aware that during the washing treatment, uh, not all of these labels can be removed. And that's, of course, related to the nature of the adhesive. So here, for this year, Rossiclass is planning to perform tests in order to uh, check which chemistry of adhesive, for instance, can be highlighted as an issue in terms of, washab uh, of washability, uh, and which adhesives are on the opposite, fully compliant with the current recommendations. And that will come, of course, with the uh, mapping of the state of the art of the washing uh, technologies used today by PT recyclers in Europe to ensure that there we are, let's say, having everyone on the same table. Now, a few words about the PT trays. Uh, here, as I mentioned, uh, these guidelines, uh, even though endorsed by Recyclas, is developed by Petco Europe. Uh, and here you can see it's related to transparent, clear mono PET trays. Uh, I didn't give a lot of clarification on these guidelines, but uh, as you can see, they are based on the traffic light color system with the all or at least a majority of the of these, uh, let's say, packaging features present, uh, either as defined as full compatible, limited compatible, or low compatible. Even though limited compatibility, there is this word limited that sometimes is, uh, <laughs> can cause some uh, issue. I want to insist on the fact that uh, here these guidelines are uh, made uh, for circularity. So that means that limited compatible with circularity, you can still, you are still, let's say, compatible. Uh, I highlighted there also one point saying that Petco is currently uh, investigating on developing a new guidelines for carbon multilayer trays, uh, but I will not speak about it today. Uh, talking about the design of PT trays, one of the key elements and one of the key questions we are uh, often receiving is related to leading films. Uh, how to design them, which uh, polymer to use, for instance. There, as always, we are privileging a monomaterial approach, meaning that if you can go with an unprinted PET uh, leading film, that's for the best. Otherwise, you should use 
a leading film that can be separated by density during the recycling process. So that means uh, polyolefin films, for instance. But something important here to, to highlight is the fact that there should not be any glue residual on the packaging because this glue will then uh, contaminate the stream and can cause yellowing, for instance, or other issues, as I previously mentioned. So here, I reported some of the uh, procedures that uh, were developed as standard methods uh, in order to evaluate if, for instance, the glue can be correctly washed off. And talking about recyclability, I would like to close uh, the topic here uh, with a word on the packaging, packaging waste regulation proposal and the current alignment with Racicla certification. Here, it's good to see that uh, both the Commission and our organizations are uh, defining that a packaging can be called recyclable only if it contains at least 70% of a mono material, uh, of one single material. Otherwise, you will end up in a class E or a class F, uh, and you will not be able, if the proposal remains, to, uh, um, to claim that your packaging is recyclable by 2030. As I see, I have uh, two minutes left. I will just give you, um, let's say, a few words about what Recyclas is doing uh, for the recycled content. So I talked to you about some uh, certification that we developed. Here, uh, the, what Recyclas aims for is to ensure traceability of uh, the uh, plastic waste and of the recycled content, transparency as well of, what, uh, of how much recycled content contains a packaging. And then that's, of course, to uh, give trust between all the actors and the consumers. Um, so here, uh, if we go a bit more in the details, that means that the origin of the waste must be verified uh, through an audit or a certification. Also, that the recycled content uh, based on inputs plastic waste uh, calculation must refer to the real percentage present in the plastic uh, packaging. So that means no free allocation, for instance. And we are also taking into account the environment environmental impact of the recycling process. For those of you who would be interested, uh, here are the two uh, certifications. Uh, so one dedicated to the recycling process, the other one to the traceability of the recycled uh, plastic. So there that means that all the different actors of uh, the uh, value chains are, let's say, involved uh, in these uh, two certifications. So. Uh, I would like to, to wrap up saying that uh, Rossi Class is indeed uh, a toolbox today that uh, uh, is here to support the industry in this uh, journey to circularity. And uh, if there are questions, I will be more than happy to answer them later. Thank you, Sean Emil, for a very interesting presentation. And uh, we at Plastic. Swedish plastic recycling are very happy to be supporters of your different systems. So, uh, thank you. Uh, we will uh, have you back on stage uh, in a few minutes for uh, uh, answering questions. Uh, the next speaker will be Elna. Uh, Elna uh, is coming from uh, 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 Orkla Food, Sweden, where she works as a development engineer. And uh, uh, Elna Halgard, uh, we are very much looking forward to hearing your presentation as well. Thank so please, you, Rikard. go on. Not, uh, not so easy to come up here uh, at the last person after so many uh, interesting and inspiring speakers already, but I, I hope I will, and I will do my best. So uh, I will start talking about the, the consumer-friendly solutions in this uh, circular world. But first, a few words about uh, Orkla. Uh, Orkla is a Norwegian uh, company uh, which uh, consists of five different uh, dif business units uh, within uh, branded consumer goods. And it's Orkla Foods, Orkla Confectionery Snacks, Orkla Care, Orkla Food Ingredients and Orkla Consumer Investments. And uh, in total, we have uh, over 20,000 employees uh, worldwide today. 
Uh, but uh, if uh, Orkla might be not that well known, I hope that uh, our brands are more uh, uh, familiar to you. Uh, our brands are uh, a large part of uh, Swedish uh, food heritage and are uh, prepared with uh, consideration for both the people, sea and uh, land. And uh, we are divided into two different business units. One is the retail part, which uh, pre uh, produce and uh, serve the, the retail market and the consumers with the tasty food. And then we have the, the other part, which is food solutions, where we produce for, the, for uh, bigger households, schools, uh, restaurants, uh, hospitals and so on. And uh, we are one of uh, Swedish, Sweden's uh, leading food players and uh, our market leaders also in, in uh, most of our categories. And Orkla Foods in Sweden, we have uh, nine different uh, factories or sites where we produce our uh, foods ourselves. Uh, and they are specialized at uh, different uh, types of foods and different types of production. And uh, for this we ne need and use all types of uh, package material like metal, glass, paper and plastic of course. And, and different kind of plastics and, and uh, PET uh, of course. And I will come back to the use of PET later on. Um, yes. And of course, we uh, in our uh, sustainability strate strategy for uh, 2025, we have of course uh, goals regarding the packaging, and we want all our packages to be uh, recyclable. Uh, and we also want to use uh, a part of uh, of the packaging made of uh, recycled or uh, renewable uh, material. And uh, that is a goal and a target that we work really hard on, uh, have done it for, seven, for a couple of years and we'll, we'll continu continue that work. And for us as a food producer and brand owner, we can do it mainly, our two main uh, tasks is to, to motivate our consumers to recycle and also design our packages that are suitable for, for recycling. And that is uh, the two parts that I will talk about more uh, now. So, uh, to be able to, to motivate the consumers to, to sort more, we first uh, need to know about our consumers and their attitudes towards uh, packaging and sustainability. And therefore, we have uh, conducted a survey for that. Uh, and I'm going to result, uh, present the results for you for some of the questions. And this, this study was uh, performed uh, in uh, October, November, and we have just recently got the result. And that is the fourth year that we have done this uh, survey, so we can see the trend over the last four years. And it's performed in, in all the Nordic countries and the, the Baltics. Uh, yes, so we go to the first question then. Here we have the, the question where the, this is one of the first ones where the consumer should, should uh, in some way rank what, what they think is the most important uh, envi environmental topics for them. And uh, on top we see that the global warming uh, and uh, the, the plastic in the oceans and the climate changes are still the most important one. Uh, we also see that the uh, worries over fo food sources and supplies jumps up a bit. And uh, that's the largest change that we see this year. Maybe not surprising because it might be due to the war in Ukraine and, and the high infl inflation of two uh, food products. Uh, we see that there are also some uh, uh, concern about overpackaging of consumer uh, goods, even though it has uh, slightly decreased since uh, the last years. So we see that the uh, plastic and packaging and waste are things that the consumer are concerned about, and, and I think it's uh, important. Uh, and uh, another question is, how concerned uh, would you say that you are about plastic packaging, uh, if they are made from recycled material or not, and, and if it's possible to recycle? And then, then uh, around uh, half of the answers say that they are fairly concerned. So it's uh, still around 50%. Then, of course, we know that the people in this type of service, uh, they, they say something and then they might not do the thing when they shop, of course. Um, yes. So, um, 
here we have uh, four different statements. Uh, and the first one uh, for uh, the importance of having products packed in recyclable packaging uh, seems to have a slightly negative trend, but it's not uh, significant. And we see that there is, uh, uh, in 2020, we see that there is an increase in, uh, in, um, in the responses saying it's often difficult to know if, if the package can be recycled. But then they have significantly decreased after that, which may indicate that, that consumers uh, find it slightly easier. Uh, and uh, a little over half agree that they would rather choose packaging ma made of recycled plastic, uh, but there is no change. So, and if we break that down demographically, the, the, these four different uh, statements, we see that there is a change in how people answer. For example, we see that the concern is uh, higher among females than male. We also see that there is a higher concern uh, the elderly the people get uh, for these types of questions, which I think is uh, uh, quite interesting. So, uh, the previous slides show us that there is an interest from the consumers to know if the package is, re is recyclable uh, uh, or not. And uh, as uh, Helen also said, it's very important for us to make the package uh, be able to be re recyclable and do it as easy as possible. Uh, it could be, for example, to make it uh, very easy to empty or uh, easy to to uh, take the parts, uh, take the different parts uh, separately, uh, and that uh, there is not so much uh, grease around it. And another thing that we can do, uh, at least, is to have the clear sorting instructions to keep them in quite big letters and have these uh, pictograms on the package as well to uh, even more make it easier. And a third way thing that we have done is have a cooperation with Bauer, which is an app where you can register when you sort your package and then you can get a small refund to, to uh, increase the uh, attention to this topic and make it, maybe make it a little bit more uh, fun. So then I will go, back, uh, go further and talk about the other part, how we can uh, work with the designing uh, packages for recycling. And the first question is, is of course, uh, why we will like to choose uh, PET as package material. For us, it could be that it's quite light in uh, weight, for ex uh, especially if you compare to glass, and then also mean it's a lower climate impact. It's quite uh, a high strength, hardness, stiffness, which could be good for certain types of applications. It could be both colored or really transparent, like glass. Uh, and also it could be formed in line. We have it in the production line where we, where we form the bottles in the line, which create a quite effective uh, process and, and produce less energy. Then today, our pet is uh, approved for food contact, which means that we can have our pet within the package uh, as well, which is not possible for other plastic in that way today. Uh, but not to forget that the main purpose of the package is to protect the product uh, and protect from food waste. So that's uh, where we have the most important in environmental uh, impact of the package. Uh, and uh, the package must preserve and, and uh, preserve the quality and the taste, the whole uh, shelf life. And different products have different types of re requirements. Some uh, products are more sensitive than others for chemical or uh, microbial breakdown. Uh, and uh, for example, if you have a product without preservatives or, or, or so, uh, that they might be even more sensitive and have uh, requirements of a certain barrier or so. And then there could also be certain design elements uh, or that you want to use different certain colors to, to differentiate from others or, or to make the consumer find the package uh, in the stores. So, so, so the product itself have, have their requirements. 
And then, of course, uh, we also want to fulfill these uh, recycling uh, criteria, so the package is recyclable. And here is some of the criteria that uh, they look today. And we look, of course, both on the Swedish Svensk Plast winning, but also on the, on the rest of the class criteria, and try to fill, fulfill them as much as possible. In some parts it's easier, and some parts we have to work more with. And so our challenge, as we see it, is, is to, to combine these uh, two uh, challenges into one. We both to have the both be able to fulfill the recyclability, but also the, the product uh, requirements. And I think, as we have heard here today, there is a lot of go things going on with new technology development, uh, and we also have to do things to 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 so we can have a cooperate and, and come together to one. Uh, sustainable solutions. Uh, for example, from our point of view, we can have, if we need a barrier, at least we have to find a barrier in, in the product that is uh, possible to, to recycle and uh, fully compatible with that requirements. And of course, if we want like to have to use a color, we might think of you use less color or, or use a certain type of color, which also com com um, comply with the, the recy recyclability requirements. So I think we will uh, come up to that, that we have a, a, a package in the future which is both uh, protected products, very good, and also is fully recyclable. So to the last uh, slide, uh, this is a moving target, which of course is very positive because it means that there's a lot of things going on and a lot of things happening, uh, which also makes it very inspiring to work with these uh, things. But it also uh, makes it a little bit uncertainty because you never know what's, uh, what's okay today and what will be okay tomorrow and things happening so fast and, and all uh, the time. Then we also have the new legislation coming up. We, we, won't, we know today that it will clearly affect us, but we don't know exactly how and how it will be uh, implemented, but uh, that it will affect us, that's for sure. Um, and then at the, the last point is that we still need to, to, uh, to, um, to um, uh, communicate with our cons uh, consumers and to inform and inspire them and uh, let them know how important it is to, to recycle and sort uh, their packages. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elna. Uh, you are welcome over to our side of the stage. Uh, a very good summary in the end here, I think. The moving <laughs> target. Uh, is it anyone else who wants to... to, uh, to uh, uh, continue that summary, the moving target, I think that can be a very good summary. Uh, how is it for you, uh, Hans? Is it a moving target, food contact materials? At the crossroads, let me see what, <laughs> what is the exit. <laughs> uh, I don't know, really. Um, there are good things, in, in, good ideas, I would say, also from the legislators and understanding the complexity of all, all of this. So, so um, let, let it be a moving target then. <laughs> yes. How about consumer behaviors? Are they constant? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> they are moving the whole time. No, I mean, you need to be on your toes in order to figure out how to address this moving target, but also then the consumer, because they also are influenced by things and they are changing and they are context in the different countries as well as areas. So, so it's a lot to keep track on. Hmm? Yes. And design for recycling... We uh, see it as a moving target as well, as uh, Elna was uh, saying. Can you also comment a little bit on that, uh, Jean-Emile? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I would say that there is always room for improvement anyway. Uh, and I think that the industry needs to, to evolve to ensure that some elements, for instance, that were used in the past in packaging are not used in the future in order to, to close the loop. Uh, and yeah, indeed, for, for sure, that's a, a moving target because also depending on the evolution of the recycling system, as our colleagues from the first session were mentioning there, that means that the recommendation may evolve as well because some things that are allowed today may not be allowed tomorrow because we'll 
for instance, penalize this, uh, this process. But it can also be the opposite, depending on how this evolves. So for sure, there, I mean, there is a lot of things to keep an eye on, and I'm not sure that two eyes are enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, very good. I, uh, I uh, will see if we have any questions from the audience. Uh, are you? I see that there is at least one raised hand on the uh, uh, left side from me here. Uh, so Tove, please. Thanks, everyone, for good presentations. I'm Tove. I work at. Uh, Dagab. And uh, Sean Emil, you uh, mentioned uh, the criteria from Recyclas and also in relation to the legislation coming up. So, does that mean that Recyclas will be a part of uh, this delegated act coming up for determining the criteria for recyclability? That's a tough question. No, I, I, I must say that uh, Recyclas, even though there is indeed this uh, good comparison between uh, the PPWR and Recyclas today, uh, Recyclas is not doing any advocacy, I would say. So we are really uh, willing to stay purely technical. Now, of course, if tomorrow the Commission says that there is one rule for recyclability certification, then uh, Rossiclass will follow it as everyone will need in Europe. So uh, I would say that we will adapt, of course, but uh, I mean, we are uh, also aiming at indeed generating more and more data every time to ensure that the decision that will be taken by others will be based maybe on, on uh, uh, um, let's say, a bit on what we are doing so, and what we are recommending. Do we have more questions from the audience? Yes, I see that uh, Willem is raising his hand here, so. Yes, I was just a bit surprised by some of the outcome of the survey uh, in the last presentation, because we were also addressing, or I was at least addressing, that we need to educate the consumer. They need to know the value of waste. I mean, I was totally surprised that older people seem to be more worried than younger people. But they are the future. So how should we address our approach as a value chain then? Because if they seem to not care as much, how do we handle that? Maybe Helen can yeah. help us a little bit. Yeah, perhaps I, since I also every fall meet new students that I teach sustainable development for. No, but I would say that is also a bit polarized today as so many other things in society, meaning we have a quite large group of really committed, really engaged young people that forces us older to do better. But we also have a fairly large group that doesn't care that much at all, unfortunately. And if you take those two then and make a middle, it seems like they are not that engaged or commit. Uh, but I think it's also that group with the not caring or the ones that are against society and are, yeah. No, no but, but, but there are those groups. The polarization is also there in the younger groups as well as in many of the other uh, yeah, groups in society today. Is it someone else who wants to, to add in on this? Yes, yes. I think, yeah, as you said also, that shows also the importance that it's important for us to continue to, to uh, educate and inform about mm -hmm. that. And then also I think it's this uh, concern about the, the environment and so on. In some cases when it comes to their own household and so comes maybe later on when you get uh, have family and, and get, go, getting older. Mm -hmm. We have more questions in the audience, uh, if we have a microphone here. Oh, hello, Torkel. Now, I was thinking about Sean Emil's 70%, uh, at least 70% of one material to be considered recyclable by 2030. Otherwise, it would be like category E and not allowed. But then I saw some yogurt packs on another presentation, which I know have more than 30% plastics and the rest is fibers. So. Uh, it would be covered by the same regulation, of course, but it's also 70% or at least 60% renewable resource uh, bio coming from bio sources, so to say, and the other 40% might be plastics. But uh, what would happen to such a package 2030? <laughs> That depends uh, how the PPWR will be, uh, but uh, no. 
I mean, for sure, there will be always some very specific packaging with, I would say, strange design. Uh, uh, but let's say that if we need to be generic, a monomaterial approach should be followed as much as possible. Of course, there will, for sure, for some packaging, always uh, be the need to have some barrier properties to protect food, for instance, uh, or to have some labels saying what is the composition of, of your packaging. But I think that a 70% uh, monomaterial, valuable material, because talking about the PET, for instance, the polyolefin can as well be separated and recycled. Um, I think that's something that can be realistic for almost all the packaging. Uh, so if, if we would have better recycling facilities and, and better utilization of the different components in a package, then it would be considered a recycle anyhow. That's true. Uh, there, uh, I must say that uh, as Rosikas, we are focusing on the current state of the art of uh, recycling facilities in Europe. So, uh, meaning for PET mechanical recycling, but uh, I mean, as you heard, there are also other, uh, let's say, uh, technologies that are coming. Um, and um, yeah, if in the future the industry evolves by having new purification uh, steps or uh, let's say other processes then for sure we will adapt those, of course because then there, there is value uh, let's say for these other recycling process too. Mm. Can I just Absolutely, just, Helen, yeah, please. Just a short comment. If you take away the plastic cap and you produce the, the old uh, liquid packaging board in brick, I think you manage the 70%. So it might also be a revival of some products that we had years ago, if you, if you change it again. Yeah, that's another story. Yeah. Not, not, <laughs> not any longer available for fresh products. Mm. I, I, I must uh, continue on this uh, matter of composite materials. How are they uh, being handled un under food contact material legislation when you have... Uh, uh, we were talking previously here on uh, ABA structures. They are being considered to... The, 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 inner layer in contact with the material is the contact material, but the B layer inside is still a part of the ABA structure. How is it when it comes to composite packaging, when you have a, uh, a plastic barrier on the inside and then you have the paper? Uh, how, it is, uh, how should those be treated out under FCM? Well, then, then it becomes why people like me are having a job. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's getting a bit complicated, more than it's perhaps should be. And, and how, how do you assess these layers and how do you assess the, the complete system or, or construction? And maybe that is something that at least the, the Commission has seen, that we, we need to improve uh, how we put down the requirements. So, but we're not really there yet. And again, the plastic is harmonized <laughs> on the EU level, the other parts might be not. And, and how do you make a system of the risk assessment anyway. Mm. So, uh, it wasn't an answer, it was just an explanation of it the situation. It is complicated. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's not advanced, it's only complicated. Yeah. Uh, the plastic is sometimes being seen as a, a bad material, uh, Elna. Uh, how do you see on the development from moving from plastics into more fiber materials? Is that uh, something that is very common in, uh, in Orkla as well? Uh, well, uh, we are uh, looking into the, the goals that I, I showed and I think uh, we have to look on the total picture, which is the best alternative for this product in this case for the consumer and for the environment. And uh, in some cases, a fiber-based alternative might be better and, and in some a plastic one. And I think that the, the, the opinion that people have and consumers have about plastic that they tend to end up in the sea and the ocean, when we can come back and show them these results that we have and they actually can be recycled and we can show them prove it uh, by showing uh, real uh, new packages or new products, then I think that will disappear a bit. Mm. Uh, time is unfortunately running out. I could continue all night, uh, but uh, we have other things to do, I think, in the audience. So I will uh, wrap all things up. 
by saying that uh, I, I like the moving target. That is a perfect explanation of what we are working with right now. We have legislation that is changing. We have new technologies coming. We have consumers who want to have something and we need to adapt to that as well. And, and uh, we can continue uh, for a long time and, and see that we will have a moving target in the next few years. Uh, me and my colleagues uh, from Swedish Plastic Recycling and F FDI want to say thank you uh, all for coming and listening online uh, on this event. Uh, for you who uh, have joined in the stu studio, uh, we will uh, stay here uh, in the studio for a couple of hours and uh, continue to, to uh, answer your questions. Um, we will also, after the, this uh, event, we will publish uh, the recorded event uh, so that you can see it afterwards. Uh, and uh, with that said, I hope to see you again uh, next year, hopefully when we do something similar to this. So thank you all for listening. <laughs>